Ready? I'm ready. Oh Rolling. here with a, another session of CIC. Oh, it's great. It's not CIC. We're at CIC, but we're actually here doing two techies um, raw and uncut footage today. So I'm actually here with one of my newest friends, um, Chad. We actually were able to meet at Summit at Sea. Uh, seen each other around, but never got a chance to actually communicate and talk. So here's our chance to actually talk. So unfortunately for Chad, he thought we were just going to have a conversation. Uh, so I was so, hoping maybe be lunch. <laughs> I was hungry. I got to I got to feed him afterwards, <laughs> but um, I had to bring him on the show because he has a lot of great things going on and want to get into it. So Chad, you don't know what's going to happen. So just natural response. Um, all language is accessible, but just know that it's your image you have to represent. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, so Chad, when did you fall in love with tech? Um, I think I was later to the tech game than most people. I'm an analog guy by nature. Okay. Um, so music was always the thing that kind of uh, grabs me and I, I kind of pushed away the digital side of that for a while because I felt like, you know, as a, especially as a jazz musician, as somebody rooted in tradition, mm -hmm. that um, the tech was kind of a shortcut and a lot of people didn't really arm themselves with the, the knowledge of the history of the art form you know, by cutting off a side of it, okay. you know, because technology makes that more accessible to people. And then as I, you know, have kind of matured as a musician and as a professional in the industry, have really started to understand that that accessibility is, is the key to reaching an audience. And so in my musical career, as well as in, you know, running an organization, um, you know, not only just to communicate with other people, outside of the art itself um, but to incorporate that into the art and make that accessible for other people to understand what it comes from and, and how to digest it is really important to me so i'd say i don't know as a like so intro to it i think i'm going to be in one of those positions if you could please pass me in that bag the brown thing i, I can already see chad is going to take me down this path today where i'm going to have to take notes so um one of the more famous spots. Yeah, you yeah, can only do so on, much on the computer. Or you something? can only do so much on the computer. Okay, but okay. it gets it gets a lot deeper and a lot more personal in here. So uh, don't ask me. Pictures in there. Yeah, man. Artistic. Old school. Well, you know I'm an artist by nature. That's I where do, everything yeah, comes from. So that's what that's what I learned about you on the, uh, on the <laughs> boat. Oh yeah, because you saw the, the the skateboard that I got. Yeah. Paint. So I mean, the first the first time we met was actually you tried a bunch of my kids at the. Black Tech Week and, and got one of them going on how much he spent on a pair of shoes. Yes. He felt like the biggest, you know, <laughs> like he just, he just walked right into it. And, and we, you know, now it's funny. Now we, you know, I, some of my kids in, in the program have gotten old enough that I'm hiring them for gigs okay. and stuff like that. And before I, I pay any of them, we make sure that they have a bank account set up and that they tell me what they're going to spend the money on or what they're not going to spend the money on, more importantly. See, that was dope, man. He's, what he's talking about in reference is the $125 on a pair of Jordans versus $125 to get an LLC. Mm -hmm. But uh, actually, initially, that was something I kind of got from Felicia Hatcher when she does the, she's holding a $20 bill. Oh, and she's the best. Who wants $20? And the kids just sit there and finally a kid will come up and grab it. But that's always been so, again, you learn from your peers. So with um, guitars over guns, um, I guess you have some elements of innovation. I mean, some elements of tech, but you have a lot of elements of innovation. But if you had to comprise it to a simple, simple form or just an answer, what do you feel you actually do in tech or innovation? Um, I'm not sure it's such a simple answer, but I think uh, what we do in tech is um, collect and manage data. Okay. In terms of how effective our programs are. Okay. And communicate to our stakeholders. Those are the two main things. Aside from the actual nuts and bolts of like music production and some courses and, and stuff like that. 
the main two things we use uh, tech for communication and data management. So when you say collect and manage data, what are what are the artists or what are your musicians actually using that data for? So after every session, our mentors report on each uh, on each session how well it went, how effective their planning was, as well as um, their experience with each student. Mm. So we keep our groups relatively small. Um, we try and keep it at like three to five students so that that personal relationship is formed, which is a, bit, a lot more of a one-on-one -on -one relationship. Yeah, that, that's okay. the keystone to what we're doing. I mean, music is the bridge, but the relationship that you form with an adult that cares about your success and empowering you with the tools to be successful is by far the most important element of the program. So you have to use a lot of technology in, in the music industry these days, whether you want to or not. And so if you looked into what you're doing um, with Guitars Over Guns, What's some of the main, I guess, the main components of technology that you feel musicians just are missing or just basic components that they should have in place? Um, I think it's a double-edged sword. So one, you know, people are instantly accessible mm -hmm. through technology, um, but people's attention spans are much lower. And so I think it's about how do you deliver you know, a piece of what you do as an artist enough to excite somebody to come and have that live experience. Gotcha. And then how you capture that live experience and feed it back out into the, you know, into the world so that people can continue to appreciate that. So for you, tech <clears throat> is kind of a gateway in or a gateway for more accessibility and people have to use it as such. It's not the end result, but it's just another gateway. Well, but it's also an end result to the people that aren't there. Right. You know, so like, it, yeah, it's that gateway to getting people in the door to marketing yourself. Like every musician to me is an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. You have to be, you have yeah. to have that skill set. And so you need to think about who you are as a brand, what you're delivering, what your market is. You know how saturated that market is. What what your differentiating qualities are as an mm. artist um, and as a brand, and, and then how do you package that in a way that makes people interested about what you have to say? What's your perspective? To me, it all comes back to authenticity. So, if you're an authentic individual, how are you how are you getting that? How are you telling that story? You know, got some good nuggets for people to understand. Uh, music is a brand. You have to treat it as such. Yeah. I like that. So. Let's let's have a little bit more fun real quick. Um, what is your favorite, craft beer or a craft cocktail? Craft cocktail. If you were drinking a craft cocktail and we were going right now, happy hour, at two o'clock in Miami is happy hour, what would I be getting you? What would we be drinking? Um, probably old fashioned. Old fashioned? Yeah. Bourbon or whiskey? Rye. Rye? Yeah. Oh, nice. Rye whiskey. All right. Um, that's one of my favorites, by the way. Uh, so maybe we should go downstairs we'll make and make that happen. happen. <laughs> it's been a long day already, man. I can tell you. <laughs> make that happen. Um, if your business life was based on a movie or a TV show, and we could plug into you, turn you to that wall, and you're projecting that movie or TV show right now, what would I be looking at? Oh, man. Step Brothers. Step Brothers. Prestige Worldwide. <laughs> Prestige Worldwide. <laughs> No, I, um, I don't know. I mean, not overall, just right now. I got, I got, I guess I got to think about that, but I mean, I think like maybe you remember Puff Daddy's show, Making the Band? Making the Band? Yeah. So it's kind of got a lot of elements of that to me where like you're putting people in a, a a pressure cooker situation. And I don't even know if I really even watched that show, but I'm just trying to think of the elements that my life was kind of. You it's know, almost death. irrelevant. That's how big that show was an impact into. It changed a lot of things as far as the music industry and how people started seeking talent. Yeah, but, yeah, so. for sure. Um, but I guess maybe you could look at yourself just that way a change maker. It doesn't really matter what the show had into it, but those elements of the intensity of Puffy. Uh, like you said, taking great talent in and trying to harvest it because a lot of that was just raw talent. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. And and it needed mentorship. But you know, you needed to kind of chip away at the rock. And so I think, um, you know, putting people in a situation where they're forced to thrive or or bail is kind of, you know, what I think a lot of our kids are in the, in our program and. 
I guess this is true of people in my life in general, but like, you know, you're put in a situation where, where it's time to step up or, or move on and, right. and you don't really have time for people that are just kind of half in, half out. And so yeah, you need a dedication and commitment. Yeah. And you need those people to push you too. Right. I mean, it's, you know, it's not all self-serving like, or, you know, this kind of like I'm here for everyone else thing. Um, it is, and that's where that comes from, but that also is self-serving in the sense that I feel good about the work I'm doing. I feel good about the change that we're trying to create. I like surrounding myself with people that, that are more afraid of disappointing themselves than they are disappointing me, okay. you know, in terms of like management strategy. I got um, you. So I think, you know, it, in terms of putting a bunch of talented people together, which I, I get to do, I feel like I get to quarterback talent, you know, in a lot of ways. Which is important, right? Um, and I, yeah, I mean, I, the, some of the best advice I ever got as a musician that's applied to the rest of my life was, was be the worst guy in your own band, you know? Always surround yourself with better musicians so you'll play to their or level. Or be the dumbest guy in the room when you're yeah. in the tech. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so you, you'll play to their level. And if you don't, you'll work hard enough to figure it out. Get up so, to that level. Um, so in that sense of like there being a, a very um, productive, competitive nature, um, it's probably something that just my personality and you know, like history of, of being everything from an athlete to just a type A personality. In music, it's not so cutthroat, um, I want to beat you, but it's very competitive. Very I was about competitive, to say, there's so. a little bit more of a brothership, I think, in music. For sure. So, and just kind of a, this is a different question, not for our traditional format, but if you had to name the most famous person you've gotten to play music with versus the most admired person, admiration from your end, who would those two artists be? And famous just being pop, pop, pop culture, not by the probably, even quality of music. Probably Pitbull. Pitbull? I think okay. he's probably the biggest person you've played for. Yeah, I mean. He is Mr. Worldwide. Yeah, well, at the time he was Mr. 305. Right. And then he was Mr. You know, it's like, <laughs> he's, I don't know where we're going to go after Mr. this. Mr. Universal. You know, he just found seven more planets, <laughs> right. so give him time. <laughs> he'll be there. Um, but no, I mean, the guy's a hustler, you know. We, we came on the band right when, um, uh, what was the big song he had? Um, like his, his first big hit. And we were, He's we, had a lot of hits, I think. But it was like the first uh, uh, one, two, three, four. Oh, I, I know. I know you want. Mm -hmm. So uh, right when that came out, we did like, you know, the, the, the TV run with them for Conan was on Tonight Show at the time. And so all that stuff. from your end, most of my artists you've gotten to work with. Um, like, who was you the most excited to work with? So my own... Hero mm -hmm. um, is this guy Fred Wesley, who's a James Brown's trombone player for okay. all those all those years. Um, you know the guys that wrote him and, and Pee Wee Ellis, and so um, the, I mean Pee Wee wrote Cold Sweat, which is right. the beginning of funk. Yeah. So I got a call. Hmm. It was New Year's Day in 2008, I think, and I, I'm terrible with dates, but that gives you some indication of how significant this was in my life. And Fred, my hero, wasn't going to do this next set of dates with Pee Wee's band, Still Black, Still Proud, um, which is an African tribute to James Brown. So here I am, the white dude on the beach, on New Year's Day, getting a call to replace my absolute hero mm -hmm. in a band called Still Black, Still Proud. That's like, dope. The, the most amazing and uncomfortable moment ever. <laughs> I'm like, man, how, you know, Fred's like the, the funkiest soul brother, you know, ever to pick up a trombone or a horn in general. And so it's just like so overwhelming and, and intimidating um but it, it was the most incredible musical experience oh man that's amazing made. yeah so to date um if you could say maybe more so what are some of the biggest challenges or struggles that you're dealing with with guitars over time um i think one of the biggest challenges we have is is trying to stay focused i think okay. there's so much that needs to be done in our community right now and we've kind of unlocked this way to reach people through music um, that you see all these avenues to really make an impact whether that's you know we've developed an art program and a dance program and now I see all these paths for um, you know developing digital music and, and music production and, and all these things it's really easy to spread yourselves you know, thin in that way. Trying maintain, to do everything. Yeah, and maintain program quality. Um, and it's also really hard to look at a grant that is offering you a lot of money that you think could kind of um, 
take care of a lot of your fundraising concerns and say, oh, this is kind of like what we do, but we, if we just tweak these things and go in this direction, it's, you know, it's still true to us, but I think, it, I think that's a dangerous path to go down. So kind of knowing thyself has been um, a key to that for us, but. So if you took that for, and added on to what you said, if on the technical side, what do you think would have been one of your milestones in your journey or your career? Like what's been a milestone from technology that's either just pushed you to that next level? Um, definitely the integration of a CRM, of using Salesforce. Oh wow, um, and I, you would not imagine most artists, so maybe you, you should dive into that real quick. What, how exactly, and CRM is client relation management for people that don't know what a CRM is. How has a CRM actually advanced you as an artist or even advanced your program? So, you know, having one place to keep all your records of people that have interacted with your organization. So that could be your email list, your donor base, your mentors, your students. Um, all of those people need to be managed and, and dealt with. You don't want your donors to only hear from you when you're, you know, trying to tell them how much you need them for this right. or that. And Constant and engagement. Um, yeah, and, and to let them know how their investment is, is paying off, what the ROI is. So your return on investment for, you know, a nonprofit organization is gonna be a lot different than a tech startup, but it's still a return and you need to let people know what that is. And so- Sometimes um, a return is more than money, especially sure. when you're reaching kids. Um, what is the current CRM that you're using? Salesforce. Salesforce. So yeah. y'all heard it. So Salesforce, big thing for you to have. Yeah, and so integrating that with our other platforms for for fundraising and, and like you know donor management software, um, and then all the reporting that we do. So um, for a long time we had our mentors being paid on an annual stipend. So they would get you know x amount of dollars for the, for the year that would get paid at the end of the year. That's and hard. Since a lot of management. <laughs> since they since they did it voluntarily to start with. Um, but we realized how important the accountability of like having, you know, you're dealing with kids that have been through a lot and that kind of want to shorten that time period when someone's going to walk out on their life so that they'll test you and you got to prove that you're going to still be there. But if one of my musicians gets called for a hundred dollar recording session and he's living paycheck to paycheck, it's really hard for him to turn that down. And right. so we, we were like, all right, we're committed to valuing our, you know, teaching artists, our mentors time. So then we went into like, how do we, how do we really manage that? And so after we did the stipend thing and realized that it didn't really equate to like the, the, the work, you know, coming first and being paid for that work and having that feel value, mm -hmm. we moved into timesheets. Okay. And then with our musicians, I was telling you this earlier, you know, half of the guys were like, oh, well, I don't have Microsoft Excel. You know, how right. do I fill out a timesheet? And I was like, you know, by the end of it, half the guys, you know, didn't have that. Some of them didn't even have computers. They were like printing it out, taking a picture of the stuff that they filled in, texting Sick. it to me. And I'm like trying to manage all this. I'm like, man, this is impossible. And that was with 12 mentors and, and two schools. Wow. You know, now we're in 14 sites with 41, you know, mentor positions serving 650 kids. So it's, you know, it's a lot to manage. You can't deal with yeah. pictures and timesheets. <laughs> you, so now we have a form that we've we've generated that says, you know, are you hitting your your lesson objective? What are you noticing about the kids? A lot of our kids are going through some really tough stuff, and so we have like a red flag reporting system. Like I just found out, so and so is living with two other families in this one bedroom apartment. Oh. That's why she's so tired every day because she's not getting any sleep. And so how do we deal with that and, and how do we talk to that student about it? But even though you're not a tech company, you have to look into the aspects of the things you're describing is the same scalability and expandability with technology. That's um, what it is. It, it crosses over because now yeah. you're at a rapid growing rate, you have to get into management of everything. Until we did that, we, we, we couldn't, we couldn't, we could grow, but we couldn't scale and you we couldn't, couldn't maintain program enough, yeah. quality. And so my limitation for growth now is a, a matter of fundraising, not quality. Gotcha. So our quality is going to be consistent no matter how many programs we fulfill. Gotcha. Um, so that, that was, you know, the biggest kind of leap for us. So I'm going to put you in a kind of a weird position, but I have something where I just want your absolute genuine response. Don't hold back. Say whatever you feel. Okay. I'm going to give you two words. Just want you to respond. Okay. Diversity inclusion. Not something that I think about proactively, 
I think it's something that I've been caught thinking about reactively. It's never been a problem. I've always been very inclusive. Mm -hmm. My world has always been that way. Uh, I think as a musician, just naturally. Mm -hmm. um, but it's definitely something that I've learned to be more sensitive to proactively. Um, certainly with respect to mentoring, you know, black youth. Mm -hmm. um, and having to have those conversations of, you know, I can't be empathetic towards the way you're feeling from a racial perspective, but I can understand and sympathize with the fact that, you know, you feel marginalized for these reasons and that your reaction to that is going to be based in things that I can identify with. Um, I, you know, I, to me, it's, it's basic human rights and the way life should be to be inclusive of, right. of all this. So I, I think maybe it's like an idealistic mindset or, um, or it could be ignorance from not having the same life experiences, but it's not something that dominates my thought process right. or something that I've looked back on and said, oh, I really wish I would have included more. Because you're doing effects, those things now. You know? Yeah. Right. I mean, I, and I'm glad that we have been. But it wasn't by design. And so that's where I think my shift in thinking And I think a lot of people that do it and do it most effectively is something they were either already doing or it was just a part of their nature and not something they were like, oh, we should shift it this way. Because I think when you do it for the shift, it loses its authenticity. Yeah. So with that being said, if you had all the resources, now we're not worried about money, staff, we're not worried about anything. You have the resources. But to get those resources, somebody said to you, you have to sum it up in four sentences or less. So basically you can now fix some of the problems of diversity and inclusion. You can make these programs, even your program more successful, but you have to sum up how you would fix these problems in four sentences or less. What would be your response? I think education plays a huge part in that. Okay. Collective education. Um, I think we need to fix systemic issues that create a, a big divide in okay. what, you know, That's and where people are starting. All right. Um, we need to build empathy so that people understand context, cultural context. That's a big and we need to hold ourselves accountable to it. Very good response. Very good. All right. So the world is yours. Everything is going good. But somebody comes up and says, hey, man, you can choose one mentor, have access to money, time, direct phone numbers for one year, 365 days, 24 seven access. Who are you choosing as your mentor? Maybe Pharrell. Pharrell, that's a new one. Uh, I was just talking, and it's probably gonna be consistent in these conversations. I've always liked Pharrell. Um, I think whenever I get to a point where I can't be creative anymore, I like to go back to In Search Of, Nerd. Yeah. And just, and not the studio version. The original album version where it's a lot more of that straight up guitar and mm -hmm. drums. Listening to that, I always find something in that album that I never heard before. And yeah. it just makes me want to go create. It's something about listening to Pharrell that just makes me want to get down there and create something. He's oh. just not a guy you can put in a box. You can't. You know? And I don't, not every one of his, you know, songs that he's produced or whatever has been my favorite, but I've always really admired how he's created his success and defined, you know, not, not let anyone else define um, or put him in a box. But Pharrell has the perfect thing. His whole I am mother um, is who Pharrell says he is and. I remember one of the dopest things they did was probably about 2007, 2008. They uh, released a zip file that had all the beats, drums, yeah. and snares, and everything of Nerd. And I was just like, how? Because I'm not a musician. Yeah. But it was just like, at that point, I wanted to go get Pro Tools and everything else. Because just having that as a resource, it was like, what can't you create from that to have that for real sound? And then I totally changed my opinion about him with. Uh, Hidden Figures, mm -hmm. and him getting to work with Hans Zimmer to do the uh, soundtrack and the scoring. So I played on a soundtrack of his, you know, that they at, when I was at UM, it was, it might have been something for one of the Despicable Me movies or 
uh, to be honest, I don't even know where it ended up, but it was a big orchestral arrangement. And, you know, he's a brilliant guy, but he doesn't <clears throat> allow his, uh, you know, he doesn't allow his lack of knowledge about something to stop him from, from doing it. It's like, I see, I see this, I see an orchestra. Right. And so he brought an arrangement to the Dean of the Music School and just said, this is what I'm hearing, you know, help me bring that to life. And so I think, you know, that, that kind of always stuck with me because I was like, here's a guy that just doesn't let, you know, anything stop him from, from taking an idea and finishing it. Gotcha. And that, that's like always the thing that I think most of us that are creative people struggle with is like, how do we, how do we finish it? Mm -hmm. You always get writer's block. There's always something right. keeping you right. from, you know, especially if you're on your own schedule and nobody's like holding you to a deadline, like that kind of discipline. Um, and then staying true to yourself and, and to me it's all about authenticity so you know remaining and preserving that authenticity through that process is important. So what you're talking about that there is always a soundtrack to life. If your life or what you're going through right now was a song or even an album and we were able to just plug into you and hear it, what would we be listening to? Mm. funky <laughs> um i don't know you know I'm the, I'm the kind of guy that like that I'm, I'm singing along with a song my wife who's not a musician is like oh, those are not the right lyrics to that song <laughs> at all so i'm always listening to, like the other stuff that's going on right. in the background okay so um, we'll, we'll ignore the words but if we were listening to it right now what are we listening to um Probably, actually, you know what? Breaking Bread. Breaking Fre Bread. Fred West and the JB song, Breaking Bread. Okay. It's got all the elements of funk, but it, at the end of the day, it's all about sitting around a table. And I think that's like, but to me, where, where all the magic in life happens is around, around the dinner table. Gotcha. All right. So you walk away from guitars over guns, say you retire, something happens, life in what would you want to be the remaining part? What would define the le legacy of Chad? What's the legacy that you want to leave? Mm. Probably one of compassion and empowerment. I think, you know, I'd like, I, th I think one of my skills and what I've built my world around is bringing in people that are, are really amazing people. Mm -hmm. um, I've been really blessed to have a lot of those people in my life to the point now where it's, you know, it's not just a blessing. I think it's something that is um, something that I've, I've picked up probably from my pops because he's very much the same way, but um, being a central force of, of a, a connector of people. Um, and I think what I've already, you know, been able to start doing is connecting people to resources, you know, good people to good resources, to good intentions, to good actions. You know, that, that to me is kind of what Guitars Over Guns is, is, is providing opportunities to incredible young people um, that may have just been shortchanged in terms of, um, you know, being kind of coming up in a system that, that may be stacked against them in some way. Gotcha. Um, so, I, yeah, I think, you know, what I would like to see my legacy uh, is one of, of empowering people to find success and, and, and create networks and relationships with people that, that support that. All right. So um, you've put me in a, I, I've put you in a hot seat. You've had to answer all the questions. You didn't know what was going to happen. So. In all fairness, if there's either just one random thought or a question you would like to ask me that I have to answer 100% honestly, here's your chance. <laughs> um, what's the one, one record that you've copped that you go back and, and you look at now and you're like, oh man. Put this one on the, on the bottom of the stack so nobody sees it if they come over. Um, I don't hide it because I play it, but uh, Purple Rain. 
by Prince. Oh, come on, man. That's not a... All right, fair enough. Fair I'm going to tell you, enough. but it's the treasure for me because it's an album that was given to me by my mom. Okay. And growing up, I remember when we finally got HBO because we could afford it, not because HBO was just becoming uh-huh. available, but I remember being able to finally afford it. And that was a, that's something I shared with my mom. But my Purple Rain album still has the original uh, Purple Rain poster that came with it. It's in flawless condition. You never hung it up? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> it stays in the crate. We actually have about two or three copies throughout really? the family. But um, my mom, like it was one of those things like Mars versus Venus. I would say my dad might have been a little bit more into Michael Jackson, but my mom was a Prince fan, a Sade fan. So I got, my mom's a Taurus, my dad's a Gemini, and I'm on the cusp of Taurus and Gemini. Okay. So I, a lot of different personalities and elements going on there, but it would have to be that one. Other than that, um, if you were talking about the ones that don't come out, actually I don't like to play it, it would be a Miles Davis album that I have. So uh, it's his... Uh, 86 ballads, so it's not one of the originals. It's a remaster. If I had, if I could find any original Miles Davis albums, I'm sure I wouldn't play them. Um, but that's my thing. But the Purple Rain. Oh, you mean like to preserve it? Mm-hmm. I'm saying like the one that you would put on the bottom so your friends don't see it. The that's ones... what I meant. Like that. If, if there was an album okay. you bought that you like back in the day, you used to rock out to. Oh, and, that... like if anybody see you rock. Oh, out, okay. I misunderstood your question. Okay. Yeah. Like the one I would be the most ashamed of. Almost. Yes. Oh. Yes, yes, yes. Vanilla Ice. <laughs> yeah. Um, definitely Vanilla Ice. You know the whole thing? I, I used to know it. I used to know the <laughs> dance. I remember when uh, I was in the sixth grade when that album dropped. And the thing is, I probably maybe remember one other song from that album, but it would be Ice Ice. Because I can still listen to it and hear the sampling from it and how he sampled it and pretty much stole the record. But yeah, it would definitely be. Vanilla Ice. <laughs> Vanilla Ice and Shopper Ranks. I was like, man, why would you be embarrassed of Purple No, Rain? I thought you meant like the one I would hide from people yeah, so yeah, they wouldn't yeah, get yeah. access okay, to okay. it. But oh, the one I would be ashamed of would definitely be Vanilla Ice. <laughs> <laughs> Anything from Vanilla Ice. Oh, um, you know, he's a, he's like an interior decorator now. Yeah, he's actually doing his thing. You, you gotta remake yourself. There you um, go. The element of an artist is to continue creating and always reinvent yourself. All right, so. Uh, why don't you just tell the people you can look right here let them know how they can reach you on social media uh, you can hit me up at Chad Bernstein on Facebook CB Music on Instagram but more importantly at Guitars Over Guns on all the social media handles alright cool and um, congratulations I know you were recently on the Steve Harvey show so that was dope in true form of our organizational digital grass we normally close out uh, you know if you go to a black church most of the time they say does anybody have a final word and people will actually end up giving a whole nother sermon. Mm -hmm. So we do the final word, but we actually mean that one word. So one word to close us out for anything you want to say, but all you can give is one word, not a phrase, not a sentence, but simply one word. Unify. All right, guys. Thank you. This is another episode of Two Techies.